In APM, in Application Performance Management, we deal a lot with metrics. So this, this lecture, I'm going to talk about metrics, and I'm going to make sure it's exciting. So, you know, we got an exclamation point. It's, it's really exciting. It's not funny. Uh, a little bit about me. My name is Joe Rustad, and uh, I have 15 years' experience in APM and related disciplines uh, from back when I started doing network simulation. And uh, so I've been doing application modeling, web traffic analysis, mobile application performance optimization, uh, lots of stuff like that. Got a few patents. Uh, I've trained and led the first APM development team for Quest, uh, now Dell, in China. Uh, so I have experience here in China. And uh, I've done some university courses at San Diego State uh, uh, a, a long time ago. So uh, that's my background. Uh, today, we're going to cover why metrics, what is a metric, that sort of thing. Which metrics should you collect if you're doing monitoring? Jeff went through the basics of monitoring, but you need to learn about how we store and keep the data. And uh, how do we display them? How do you use them? What are they for? Does anyone know what a metric is? That's just besides Jeff, that's fine. And uh, then we're going to talk about discrete and structured data. So this is, this is pretty introductory, but we're going to cover a lot of, uh, thank you. Uh, we're going to cover a lot of uh, this so that later when you're dealing with advanced items, you, you won't get confused. So why metrics? Four, four reasons to use metrics. To show trends. So that's the whole idea is how is something you're watching over time? The basic idea, if it moves, graph it. That's what I've heard. Uh, show the trends. Is it going up or down or flat? Which way? Uh, baseline. So follow its, its, uh, what's its, it, what is it expected to be doing? So if we're looking at response time, is it normal? Is it outside the normal range? Baseline. Uh, so the question there is, are more people viewing my travel website because of a holiday, or is it because of my ad campaign? Is it, is it normal or not? Um, compression. We use metrics because raw data is really big. And there's lots of advances in big data, and we're going to talk about that a little bit. But we, we summarize metrics so that we don't have to store every single thing about, about whatever you're monitoring. And uh, thresholds. So. Uh, you set important thresholds. You talk about my CPU utilization going over a certain amount. That's, we use a metric to, to figure out if the threshold is, is uh, violated or not. So this is an example of a metric. It's graphed over time. I'm graphing a value over time. It's, it's simple. But the granularity is important. So it, this is going up, you can kind of tell, but if you summarize this with a different granularity, you get a more obvious trend. So instead of saying the raw data at, at whatever interval, we summarize it, take a moving average, and now it's much more obviously growing. Uh, this is what I was talking about baselining. So following the, the periodic nature of the metric, what is its normal range? So the, the very most basic kind of baselining is tracking a standard deviation. What's the a, what's a standard deviation of this metric? Is it outside the standard deviation for, for what it should be? Uh, in this case, we, we're tracking uh, patterns in the data and, and trying to understand normally every hour it, it spikes. So I can see uh, in, the, in this area here that it's really at the upper end of its range. It's still normal, though. This, this fluctuation is normal. I can tell because I have a baseline. The baseline is the light blue part here. So the, the metric is the value. It's going up and down, but it's still behaving normally. So um, you can think of a very basic baseline. You could just say the average of the number all the time. 
So all over my entire history, my average is five. So it's above that baseline. Or I could say today is Tuesday at 320. What's the normal range for that? So that's, a, that's baselining. Uh, compression. So uh, this is an example of taking, taking a metric and, and summarizing it. We, this is very simple. You, you have a time series of data and we want to summarize it. These are the, these are the key factors that you use to, to summarize data. The count in the time period, the sum, average, min, max, standard deviation, and the sum of squares is special because you use it to calculate standard deviation going forward. So the, I actually took some data and did the analysis, and this is some, for some, from some real data, and, and you, can, you, can, you can see, you know, you can just add up all the, all the, the numbers at the bottom. So to just take an addition, the average, you have to um, uh, calculate from these two numbers. So you can't just average this because the, the weight is different depending on how many samples there were. And uh, the min is a min function across the, the summary. You can take all of those samples and roll them up. So that's an example of compression. Otherwise, I'd have to store 17 individual values uh, and then if, it, let's say that I got to a million values, you know, that's, that's, uh, that's the purpose. So that's the formula, um, so you can have that later. If, you're, if you want to have a standard deviation from this, from this set of data, you can roll it up using that formula. Uh, this is really interesting. The metrics, they have to be uh, you have to be able to aggregate them. So that means whatever you're measuring, you have to, it has to be something that you can take an average of in order to use that compression that I was talking about. Otherwise, it's not valid. So to take some time on this. The, the average of these percentages is 40, 45%, right? So, but that's, that's valid if it's CPU utilization. But if it's something different, like how much of the time was I transmitting data? I have a 100 kilobyte packet. How much time did it spend, send to transmit it? it it's, it's wrong. You can't average it that way. There's another example um, is, is driving in a car. If I'm driving 40 kilometers per hour for five kilometers and then 60 kilometers per hour for five minutes, what's my average speed? It's actually not 50, it's 48. So th that's called harmonic mean, and if you have a value that is stored like that, you should convert it. So the lesson is use, don't express ratios in your metrics, use rates. And don't express rates that are anything but per second. So you want to convert it to a per second rate and then convert it back when you're displaying it. So when you, when you go into the labs and you're measuring something, we have some labs later in the course, when you're measuring something, you might be getting a, a metric that's like this uh, out of a system, and that's, it's say, uptime. You have to convert it. You can't just store the uptime and have it always, always be increasing. Uh, thresholds. So uh, back to our, our friend, the, this uh, metric. If we want to say, is it over the threshold or not? So we added a threshold here. That's the, what's, back to the granularity question though, uh, if I convert it, now I can see more easily that it's definitely crossed the threshold and it's staying over the threshold. So smoothing, smoothing the data in order to evaluate the threshold is really important. If we look at the top, the metric goes up, up above the threshold and then down below the threshold and then up and down and up and down and, and uh, sends a lot of emails to your boss. Um, but if you smooth the data, you get a much more calm picture of it crossed the threshold once and stayed above it. So that's, you gotta make sure that your data is, is gathered you know, and kept in a way that has the right granularity. So that's the basics of why you use metrics and you know, about granularity and aggregation. 
and, and that's a lot of monitoring. So Jeff talked about monitoring. All the metrics that he was talking about is what we're gonna, we're just gonna have a brief overview. Um, a lot more detail in Jeff's um, continuing lectures, but we're just gonna talk about the basics of what types of metrics there are, not specific to any domain, just for, for monitoring and systems management, there's three types of metrics that we care about. Performance and throughput metrics, that um, availability and capacity metrics and business value metrics. It's so for performance and throughput, uh, I categorize these in the same way because they're, they're really about uh, what the end user cares about. The application performance management or application performance monitoring, we care most about these metrics most of the time. So uh, response time for your website. How much time did it take to log in to sign a Weibo? I don't know, website popular. Uh, how many hits per second? That's a throughput measurement. How many hits is it processing? It's volume, throughput. Uh, how many database calls were made? Uh, and uh, page content size, that means how many bytes were, were uh, downloaded? How many, the page, you know, how many, how many bytes did you have to download to display the page over time? And uh, so the uh, question, any more examples? Raise your hand if you have an example of a performance or throughput metric. Wait. Okay, how about um, average grade in a class? That's a performance metric. Average number of students for a lecture. That's a throughput metric. Okay. Jeff, do you have any more? CPU consumed. Ah, that is not, that is availability and capacity. So, availability and capacity is uh, about uh, the resources you have. So, we talk about performance and throughput is, is a measurement of your, of, of the responsiveness uh, or load. This is a measurement of how much of something that you're using. So, CPU utilization, memory utilization, Java heap, like a lot of utilizations that's going to show up here. So, uh, how much uh, disk I.O. are you using? It's a really interesting one. Um, so, if anyone else has a, a availability and capacity example, that's a question. Anyone? Extra credit? No, I don't know if I can give extra credit. Jeff's first again, anybody? Okay. Yes, Jeff. Number of seats in the classroom. Number of seats in the classroom. Number, yes, there you go. Number of seats used. Number of seats available. Anything else? Number of seats made out of wood. I don't know. There we go. Business value. So they, these are the ones that usually the APM people don't, uh, don't use directly, but they report it to someone else. What's, a, how much, uh, what's the average value in a shopping cart? You go to a website to buy a Dell laptop and you add one to your shopping cart, you configure it, what's the value there? What's the average of that? That's a business metric. Uh, what's my conversion rate? How many people that come to my website buy a laptop or buy a tablet? How many people do that? What is, um, how many people use the promotion code? Um, those are business kind of metrics. So for a school, business kind of metric might be how many people took this class, um, went on to work at Dell. That would be a business metric. Any, any other examples? Anything, it doesn't have to be about um, IT. It can be any business metric you would think you would want to graph. Your grade point average. All right. So, now, sample, sampling a metric versus uh, measuring, yeah, if you're gonna collect data, you have to know if you're taking samples or if you're measuring. So in this case, if I sample this data, at those times, I get an average of 87. So that's, but th does that look like the real answer? No, right? If I, what if I sample at that time? Now it's 39. So 
sometimes you can only get samples, but you have to know that, and you can't present it as though it's not sampled. You have to, you have to take, maybe you make more high frequency samples, but it's still a sample. In, in this case, in, in CPU utilization, uh, the operating system provides a cumulative metric for CPU usage. So uh, if you can get this instead, it's much better. Um, I just take the distance, the slope on this line, and then I can take it at any time range, and it's still valid because I take it, the difference from the last time I measured. So I keep doing that, and the average is 67.6 in this example. So uh, again, we, as you go into this, uh, you're going to do the course, do the labs, you're going to be picking a system, uh, you're going to be gathering metrics from a system, and you need to know, are you getting a sample? If you're sampling, you, you have to do it at a higher frequency. You can't just take a five-minute sample of CPU utilization. If I sampled the number of students in this class, I counted everybody. That would be pretty clear, because not everyone's running for the exit. So I can sample that infrequently, but if it's a, a metric that changes a lot, you have to sample it a lot if you're sampling. Otherwise, you have to look for a source of the data that says how many students are in this class. You can look at the, the sign-up sheet, the roster. You know, that, that's more authoritative. So does everyone get, understand the difference, sampling, sampling versus, versus uh, counting? Uh, so this is, uh, this is another interesting thing to do with your data, which is to slice it. I want to know how many people took this course that are, uh, preferred to sit on the left side of the room. Uh, you know, that, how many seats were filled over there away from the speaker's desk. Uh, with uh, APM, the metric I have here is response time. All browsers. I could slice this data into response time by browser. So I took the same data, but I checked three metrics instead of just the one. And now I can see that Safari takes a lot longer to load my website than Chrome. So it's, it's a choice you make as a modeler uh, when you're gathering metrics as to how you slice it. Uh, but, but you can't do it after. If I start here, if that's what I'm capturing, I can't give you a report by browser. I have to track three things. That's called slicing. I don't know if that's a common term. Yeah, okay. Uh, so how do we display and use the metrics? Um, so time plot, that's what we've been looking at. That's the standard way to show a metric. Time plot is uh, it's, it's what you're going to be using a lot. Uh, you could do a spark line. Here's some examples. Um, a spark line uh, was introduced in 2004 by Edward Tuft. It's an intense word-sized graphic. It's kind of gone crazy, you know, um, people just do this now. I don't need to show the whole chart, I'll just throw a lot of spark lines. Don't do that. Uh, it loses its meaning. So use a spark line in a table to show a trend, uh, but you're not going to use it as the best way to show all your data. So uh, you can also have a bar chart. Uh, and bar charts for metrics are really only useful when you're splitting something up. So you've sliced it. This is a bar chart of response time. So we have, notice it's sampled. It says sampled right on it. We sample the execution time of an application. And we split up by how much time is spent in the different kinds of technology. So in this case, serv uh, most of the time is spent in the servlets. We use a bar chart, a time series bar chart, to show the, the overall average response time, and then the color is uh, where, the time, where the time went. Here's another example. It's, um, this is a bar chart of executions. Uh, what, how, many, uh, how many of the people that went to my website, the green is good, the yellow was okay, orange is bad, and the red means they had an error. So I can see that Lots of people started having errors at around 7 o'clock. Uh, again, the data has to be aligned to use a bar chart. So I can't, I can't track everything at, at different times and then turn it into a bar chart. I have to measure the data at the same time for each bar. If, so it has to be connected in order to show this way. 
uh, area chart, this is very popular. People like these. Um, again, this is similar, similar rules to a bar chart. It's just a different way to show it. So this is response time. The blue is server time, and the green is uh, browser time. And again, time series. Metrics are data over time. So it's all time series. Uh, we also, you can also do things like spinners and gauges. Uh, um, these, these are more useful to show the current value. Uh, in management and monitoring, we use color to show the state. So if something is green, yellow, orange, or red, that means that, that is something about the health of that metric. Uh, has it crossed the threshold? So all these metrics are in good shape right now. Um, the spinner would actually be spinning. It's, it's called a spinner for a reason. Uh, there's animation on the first two. Um, and, and so use these to, to give you a visualization. And you use those in a dashboard. So you create, this is the health of a, of a system. And you do that so that you lay it out in a way that's intuitive to the user so they can understand all the systems and how they're working together. Um, in a dashboard, you'll use some sort of alignment to connect the pieces. In this case, you've got, it's kind of hard to read on the screen, I'm sure. Um, but you've got network, your network health, and then you've got the input and output rates uh, of the network. And then here I've got CPU, and I've got um, in and out memory. So it's, it's, you build a model on the screen so that you can visualize the health of the system. So uh, the last topic here uh, is about discrete and structured data. And uh, so the, so some data, you can't convert it. Um, call that, in, in our management system, we call it a complex observation. But it, it, you have to, when, when you have complex data, like the names of all the students who took this class, I can't turn that into a metric. I have to store it as a big structure. So you still want to have it over time. So if we have this class every year and I wanted to track the names of all the students, that would be a complex system that can't be converted to a number. Um, some example of structured data is a topology. So what was the topology of my application? How did, where did the time go in you know, the app server, the web server, the network? Uh, how did the, the uh, time get spent? It's, a, it's complex. Can't turn it into one metric. It has to be a snapshot. So I have to create this structure every time I'm recording it, and and create the whole structure and link all the objects together and put the numbers in, and then do it again in the next five minutes. Uh, here's another example of structured data. This is a business metric. This is users visiting my website. They uh, what did they do? They logged in, they viewed their cart, they added an item, and then they checked out. Uh, and maybe they left. So I can't store this as individual metrics. I need to store this as a, a, a structured set of data. I'm going to finish early here. What? Yeah, a lot early. So, um, see you in. Um, so, and then this. Here's an alternative. Should we store raw data? Um, in this case, uh, we've got a, a scatter plot of every single hit on the website. So that's the response time. That, we can just show that. You can't see the trend, right? You can, you can see outliers. It's better to show outliers. Define outliers. Does anyone know what outlier means? The outliers are the data up here. Like these are normal, and, and these ones are kind of something's wrong. That's out, an outlier means something that's outside the normal range. Um, so what we can do uh, with that is we can slice that data on the fly. If I have discrete data, I can show you uh, what browser what browser it was, and then I can summarize it. So I can take that set. And, and then I don't have to store a metric for each one. So one of the things we're doing now with big data technologies and APM is, is going away from the metrics I'm telling you about and storing the discrete data. But you have to know, 
you have to know that you're going to save energy. Um, so I, I could switch it to location. So now this is by location. I can switch that. I didn't have to store the numbers for every location. I stored the discrete data. So this is really powerful if you can store lots and lots of data. You can store, you know, every one of those dots has a number of categories that it belongs to. It, it came from a location and it had a browser. So I can switch from browser to location and I didn't have to track the overall, um, uh, the overall number of hits from Ontario. I grabbed it out when I decided to look at it. So that the it's an, it's kind of the new way that things are going. It's more the big data approach, but it takes a lot more resources. So then then you can use um, you can use that data to filter. So I can grab those outliers, and then I can see uh, what URLs that you know what this is real data. So um, these are the three web pages that that. Uh, had really high response times in this data set. And you can just, since we're storing all the data, you can just grab them. So, but you lose, you lose the trending and the thresholds. When we, when we process and store metrics, uh, and also you lose the compression, you know, but when we process and store metrics, we can evaluate it the threshold as we do the rollups. So, you, if you do discrete data, you can, you can make it more powerful when you're looking at it, but it's a lot harder to do the, the thresholding and alarming on it. So actually what we do in, in our tool is we do both. We, we capture the discrete data and store it, and then we also report summary metrics for it so that we can run rules and thresholds on it. So, I mean, could anyone guess is the scale of discrete data that you would store. Imagine uh, your university website. How many people hit it? Hit the university website every month. How much discrete data is that? Tracking every hit and every property. Where did they come from? What did they do? It's, it's getting that discrete data is expensive. But then, if you have a problem, if you've got well, students can't register from a certain province or from a certain area, you can drill down on it and find out why. But if you stored a metric, you had to know in advance that you wanted to store the metric. You had to know in advance that, that people might have a problem from a certain area as opposed to with a certain browser. And that gets really expensive. So if you say every property of, of a transaction of someone hitting the website, every property has how many, actually uh, Forrest knows, it has about 50 properties that are important. So that means it's 50, 50 metrics, more slices. If you take the slices, that becomes you know, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of metrics. So you store the discrete data. But in some smaller cases, you're monitoring an operating system. There is no discrete data. You only have metrics. So you know, the, to kind of finish off the, the topic, you should, for the, the basic stuff we're going to do in this course, you're going to be using metrics a lot. But you should know that as big data emerges and, uh, and as the power of storage uh, advances, you'll be storing more discrete things. You'll be doing processing on discrete elements to do management. So uh, that's just to kind of go over what we covered here. Um, you know, why? It's compression, trending, thresholding, and baselining. Uh, and, uh, the metrics that we should collect, we could probably bring up your slide again and talk in more detail. Uh, but we'll, uh, what are all the metrics in an IT system that are actually important to the people managing it, uh, to the different personas? It really depends on your persona, which metrics are important to you. Uh, and uh, the ways, you know, some ways to display them. Again, time, remember it's over time. A metric means over time. Uh, and, uh, and of course, the last thing is structured data. So. We're gonna, we're gonna, um, we're a bit early. What time is this class in? So we got about 15 minutes. All right, so that's, 
that's uh, it, any questions about any either of the two presentations? Jeff had to end early, so if you have any questions for either of the, the last two, uh, now is the best time. So. Yeah, we need at least one question. It's a challenge. It's just perfectly clear or opaque. Jeff has a question, he bailed us out. All right. Banana Republic, yes, Ying Wang. CPU. CPU wait, oh, CPU wait time. So there's a metric in uh, virtualization called CPU wait. Is that the one you mean? Yeah, so that means that, um, uh, this, that means that when you're running a system, a virtual infra, uh, system that's in, uh, in a virtual environment, uh, sometimes your processor wants, your, your, your program wants to do some work, but the virtualization system says, no, no, you, you're waiting for somebody else. So the uh, Yinghua asked, which of the types of um, metrics is that? Let's see. Uh, just to remind everybody, let's, let me go way back here. It's, kind of, it's like almost the beginning. So performance and throughput, availability and capacity, or business value. CPU weight is availability and capacity. So it's a capacity metric. It's, it's invert, it's inverted, right? So it's, it's a measurement, it's an, it's an indirect measurement of how much of your system you're using. So the performance measurement that's related would be um, the average, average time of CPU weight, like as opposed to the, the total wait time. So, uh, it's, it's in the middle there, so it's, it's a good one. All right, any other questions? Not from Dell? All right, everyone's an expert on metrics. So um, again, when you get to the labs, remember you're gonna be looking at systems, you're gonna be looking for things to collect. Just remember these, these pointers about uh, knowing what you would wanna graph. Just grabbing a number isn't good enough. You need to think about the meaning of it and remember, is it am I sampling? Can I? Can it be averaged? That sort of thing. So uh, that's that's it. So we'll end early on this topic, and uh, we'll pick up more topics after the at the next lecture. So thank you. You can.